All right, welcome everybody to episode number 45 of Collectible Live. Today is Sunday, September the 11th. My name is Jeremy Lee. I do want to thank everyone who tuned in last time with our guest collector, Agassi Nazarian. That episode does live on both the Sports Cards Live and the Collectible YouTube channels. Also want to welcome viewers from LinkedIn as we are now live streaming there as well. But let's get to this week's guest. Let's bring him out. He's a career hobbyist that has collecting in his blood, Larry Richmond. Welcome to Collectible Live. How are you doing today on, on this Sunday? I'm doing excellent. Thanks for having me, Jamie. Uh, Jeremy. Looking forward to it. Great. Well, it's great to have you. To everybody watching in the chat, welcome to the show. Feel free to post your questions, your comments as we get through this episode that you may have for Larry. I think you're going to find this really interesting. We spent, uh, I think, more time than I've ever spent with any guest historically sort of getting to know each other the other day. And uh, we could have gone for a couple more hours, Larry. It was uh, it was super interesting. You your history, your your collection, your knowledge. It's it's actually it's it's unbelievable. I feel very fortunate to have you on the show today. Uh, we did meet by chance. We got to meet at the national somehow. You yeah. spotted me. Uh, do you recall that? I do. I uh, briefly we met. Uh, I think I was uh, walking with a colleague or two down to one of the ends of the show. And I see, I saw, I saw you, and I said, "Man, he's tall. This guy's taller than I am." And now we started talking. We we're introduced. We know some people. We, we we know some of the same people, and um, uh, we spoke just for a few minutes, real quickly, and uh, it was a fun conversation. And now uh, our our paths cross again. Yeah, it's nice to be able to do that sort of break the ice. Originally, I always say to people when I. You know, when I plan, whether it's Collectible Live, Sports Cards Live, I always want to uh, get to know the guests a little bit before, just so we have some rapport. It makes for a smoother episode, and it was nice to be able to do that. I think uh, let's also just let everybody know, you know, we are. this is Collectible Live. Larry, you are an early investor in Collectible, and I want to make sure everybody understands that right at the get-go. Is there anything you want to share about that or mention at all, or is it just good enough to let it let it be out there? Uh, no, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about collecting. I'm passionate about innovation and, and disruption and technology and um, excited to, to be involved in collective for, 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 you know, been involved for a long time, uh, not in the day to day um, uh, of, of operations at all. But I'm a I'm a lifelong passionate collector in person in the hobby who just really enjoys the hobby and enjoys collectibles in general that go well beyond sports. So, yeah. And uh, and we're going to let the audience learn more about that. And this is why it was fascinating hanging out with you the other night. Uh, we're going to get into your background. I want to say a quick hello to Eric, Mr. Sanderson to or he's, he's in the Boston area. So maybe yeah. you guys have crossed paths in the past. And we have Jake Dahl in the house early right now as well. Welcome, fellas, and everybody else that's out there watching. Let's get into your background, Larry, because it's fascinating. I mean, listen, I don't even know where to start with you. Do you, your, your personal experiences going to the Red Sox games and catching foul balls at the catching catching balls at the foul line or getting into your father? Where do you want to start right now? Well, um, you know, I, I think we'll start a little bit. Well, I think we'll spend a few minutes on, on growing up and being a kid and then uh, being surrounded by the collectibles business in general and then can evolve into uh, evolve from there. But, uh, you know, having grown up right outside of Boston, being a lifelong Red Sox fan and baseball fan in general, um, had the fortunate of being about nine stops on the green line, which is about 20 minutes on the train that goes from the suburbs where I live to Fenway. And just the way I like to explain it is I grew up in Fenway Park. I've been going there since I was a kid. I probably have north of four or 500 baseballs that I got at Fenway, a lot of which um, during batting practice, dozens during the game as well. But but really, you know, I would get to Fenway before the gates opened up, go to the turnstiles on the right, which were closest to the right field foul ball, because I knew my odds of getting a foul ball were the best they, they could be at that exact spot in the park. Then I would literally they, I'd get through that turnstile and I'd run. I would literally run to the right field foul pole and I'd just start picking up baseballs. And that really was the basis in the beginning 
of just collecting, loving baseball. Uh, you know, another thing which I was very fortunate um, of at the time, in, I associated with with Fenway, is I met a woman by the name of Elizabeth Dooley. Elizabeth Dooley, who passed away probably 25 years ago now, she was the most famous Red Sox fan that ever lived. She sat front row behind the Red Sox on deck circle for over 50 years. She even had commercials. She was she was Ted Williams' confidant when he was on the team. She had business. She had her, her business card that um, that said Elizabeth Dooley, a friend of the Red Sox. Okay, she gave me uh, a set of Russian dolls with the Red Sox, you know, painted in the red that I have in my in my in my family room. But and I met her by by walking down and trying to get to front row, and asking if someone was sitting next to her. And that blossomed into a great relationship. And uh, I learned a lot. I sat with her probably over a hundred games over the years. And it was really to see and learn about baseball and learn about certain things and, and how she dealt with them through, through the lens of baseball, but you know, life through that was really fascinating. And uh, one time we actually went on a road trip. We went to, uh, uh, it was the first few years of Canham Yards. And we met in Canham Yards. She got tickets through the Red Sox. And we went to a few games at Canham Yards in Baltimore. And that was great. I mean, I was out with the Red Sox players' wives and the other members of the, the, the family of the Red Sox. And it was, it was a really, fair, really fun thing to do. And she was, she was a special lady. So, yeah, that, that was another fun connection for me when you talk about Fenway Park. But yeah, season ticket holder for 25 years. I literally just gave them up this year because I it's hard to get to. But when the when it's when it's the World Series games and opening day and a few other key games, uh, I'm there. And uh, my passion's still there. Unfortunately, the team's not doing that well this year. Right on. Okay, so so talk a little bit about you know your you've got this collection of baseballs that you've that you had that you got at Fenway. But you, as as a youngster, uh, you used to also send out postcards of players through the mail to get autographs. Talk about that collection and the, I don't know, the the good news, bad news story associated with it. While you think about the for, uh, for one second, first of all, welcome Brent to the show. Um, you can email me questions, but I'm not going to get them till after the show. So probably not if it's on for today's show. Best to put them in the chat. Uh, thanks, Brent. Yeah, let, let's hear about this your autograph collection. Well, I started uh, sending self-addressed stamped envelopes to Hall of Famers. So back in the day, before they char before before Mickey Mantle, Ted Williams, Joe DiMaggio, and other Hall of Famers, before they charged for their autographs, before that was a thing, there was a book you could buy, and the book was about six bucks, and it gave you thousands of addresses. Some of the some of them went to the teams, but a lot of them went directly to the players especially the older Hall of Famers at the time. So I bought up, I bought, you know, I would buy um, predominant, mostly, mostly black and white, the yellow, the yellow, the yellow um, Hall of Fame plaque postcards. Um, and then, um, and then some eight by 10 color photographs. And I would, I would, uh, I would, you know, I had a form letter that, hand, that I would handwrite them and tell them they were one of my favorite players and would appreciate if they could sign this. And, um, then what I would do is I would code the back of the envelope. So when I rushed home from school, I'd saw I had two or three different letters. I'd flip them over to see who it was. Uh, Ted Williams and Mickey Mantle and, and maybe Joe Sewell and you know some other some other Hall of Famers. And, and it was and then at that point, once I flipped them over and saw who they were, I'm like, well, I hope they signed everything and they didn't just sign one of them. I hope they didn't sign anything and they're sending them back to me because that would happen, but not that often. And um, that was fun because that allowed me to continue that passion I have for collecting and pretend, you know, really starting the passion for collecting uh, in that sense. Um, 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 but, you know, I, the, my real passion I got from collecting, uh, you know, comes from my father, which I'll get into shortly. But um, um, it was uh, it was cool because I was able to create these mementos and these collector's items by getting signatures on these postcards. 
And it was, uh, it was fun to succeed. And, you know, I got some letters from Willie Mays, you know, some simple letters, you know, and then you get a few form letters, of, you know, like the same letter of a few years, a year apart, you know, but it, it was, it was fun. And I actually lost that collection. I, I lost my autograph collection for um, 20 years, at least. And a fam, uh, someone in my family, I think, found it when my, when my, when my, uh, when my uh, parents were moving. It turned up in the basement somewhere. So I have it back. Very happy to have it back. I have some of my own handwriting I see on some of the notes that I wrote that came back to me. And it's, uh, it's cool. So tell us, tell us a bit about your father, because, I mean, you told me all about him last night, a real interesting guy. Let's start. Tell us about your father, what he did and, and his impact on you uh, in terms of, you know, bringing it to where you are well, today. Uh, my dad, who's uh, 91 years old and alive, just spent the uh, day with him today. Um, my father uh, dealt in, uh, let, me, let me phrase that, my father still deals in rare postage stamps and owned the oldest rare postage stamp in the country, getting back to 1885. And I grew, so I grew up in this eccentric, ephemera type auction environment, because my father owned an auction house as well as being a dealer. And, um, you know, stamps didn't, didn't really interest me that much. Um, you know, sports stuff did. Um, but, you know, I, you know, I would always help my father as, as a young kid in his auctions. We worked together for, I think, about a dozen years uh, uh, as well, uh, as I started an auction house as well and helped him with his auction house. But, you know, I had some interesting exposure to um, some of the, you know, influential people in the hobby uh, and saw some really incredible and exciting things. Uh, I remember I was a young kid. It was front page news. Uh, a United States stamp brought $100,000, which was an airmail invert, which is the upside down biplane stamp. Famous, famous stamp. It's a sheet of, there's a sheet of 100 of them. No. And uh, they mailed one of Brewster's Millions, Richard Breyer. Yeah. In that movie. And my father was the first person to ever pay a hundred thousand, like six figures for a U.S. stamp. And I remember, actually, I framed that. I have that somewhere. And, um, and you know, so I grew up, I had the privilege of growing up in, a, in an auction environment, which I learned from the inside out and watched my father do deals. Uh, my father always took me to um, the baseball card shows. You know, he took me to the baseball card shows. That was kind of what we did, you know, and that he just got such a thrill out of seeing me enjoying watching me really wheel and deal as a young kid and something I was passionate about, just like my father did. And as a byproduct of, of, of uh, as a byproduct of doing what he loved, he made a living and became one of the most knowledgeable philatelists, which the stamps are in the world. So, um, yeah, I, I had very, I had excellent, I was exposed to a lot. And, um, but the thing that I learned the most from him in terms of, of, of uh, was loving, loving what you do and having a passion for what you do. And if you have that love and that passion, you know, you, you want to put that time in and that extra effort in, and that's where that knowledge and that's where their expertise comes. And that is how I kind of operate and, and I buy things that I love. You know? Yeah, so yourself now, I mean, your father was a, a stamp guy. I believe you mentioned he had an auction house that even dated back to the 1800s. Uh, you saw him, you saw your father turn his hobby, his passion into a business, and then you kind of, you know, followed in his footsteps and, and, and turned your hobby and passion for this, your, your very authentic hobby and passion, because you grew up in the environment into your own business. And before you talk a bit about what your, what that business was, and then how, you, and then what came after that, um, I just want to, Rory Crank made, or Rory Crock made this, made this comment a few minutes ago, Fenway's a special park that's coming from a lifelong Yankees fan. I think that's pretty nice to say, considering, you know, you guys don't see eye to eye as, for, as far as who you're cheering from. And Dave Durango says, uh, Fenway is a temple. I've never been there, never been to Boston. I'm going to have to get there 
one of these uh look you're looking at me like how can you not have been to fenway i'm gonna have to get there eventually right well i think yeah absolutely and i would say i'd take you but i don't know if there's a seat in the house that's gonna fit you at six uh, how tall you are i can hardly fit there so we'll have to get like emergency row or something and we'll go yeah that's how I fly, but we'll definitely we'll definitely make it work. So tell us, how did you, you know, what was your career path then? You know, you're a young guy, you're fault, you're 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 hanging out with your father, you're seeing what he's doing, he's taking you to baseball card shows, you're buying cards, you're getting into it. What was your career? How did you fall into it? Well, you know, I had no intentions of getting into the stamp business or or I didn't really envision getting into the collectibles business at that point. I, after college. Uh, after college, I moved to Manhattan for about a year, year and a half, worked on Wall Street, you know, passed all my licenses, was a broker. Absolutely uh, not for me. Just did not like it. And um, like New York, but just do not love that end of finance and in and, and, and that aspect of it. So I ended up moving back to Boston. And um, at the time, my father was having a, a large auction and needed some help, uh, just, just needed some more labor and needed some more help and was just thin on staff. So it kind of came in and helped basically run that auction with him. And what that means is running the bid book. My father runs the bid book and this is old fashioned before internet stuff, you know, and representing hundreds and hundreds of bidders. And then there's agents representing maybe a hundred bidders each. You might be sitting there and then there's telephone bidders coming in for a hundred dollar lot or a 50,000 or a hundred thousand dollar lot throughout the auction. And, um, you know, there could only be, there could only be four, six people, eight people in the audience, but there's hundreds and hundreds of people represented. So my father would run the bid book because he has uh, you know hundreds of people's bids there, and then I would basically run and coordinate everything else uh, during that. And you know that's a live auction, so there's a lot of pressure and there's a lot of a lot of scenarios going on, and you have multiple people on certain popular lots, right? That you just can't miss because they only go down once. You know they only go across the. the the auction block once. So there's a lot of logistics there. Then there's a tremendous amount of logistics to get the stuff out the door after the auction. You know, and a lot of value there too. So you got a lot of things going on. And you know, it's kind of interesting. These stamp collectors, um, you know, back in the day, stamp collectors wanted, they wanted stamps on their packages. They didn't want a meter. They didn't, you know, this was, you know, well, there was, there was FedEx. We used FedEx a bunch too, but a lot of these collectors wanted stamps on their, on their, packages to be mailed to them because they collected them you know so you know this is a real throwback of an industry and um so learn the business that way then i started realizing you know well you know, after about a year of working with my father or less than a year probably right after the auction i started working with him i said wow this is pretty cool my father's turned his his passion into a livelihood and has this great business with a great reputation. He works really hard. And, you know, I should turn my passion into my livelihood. And I, I was going to, uh, I started doing some deals in sports memorabilia, started handling, uh, got some nice properties. Um, but then what happened was soon after that, in the mid nineties, I started getting my hands on a lot of significant historical documents. And autographs of Abraham Lincoln and George Washington and Civil War, um, Civil War autographs from Union and Confederate generals. And, and in so in 1996, I ran my my first auction, which was uh, a significant. It was a Civil War auction that consisted of about a thousand lots of both Union and Confederate generals' letters, and the catalog is a reference piece today because we had so so many different generals it was a very significant auction i think the auction brought close to a million dollars and um um it was exciting and then i just started getting my hands on and being in boston i got started getting a lot of kennedy material of course then i handled a great abraham lincoln i got a great lot of of what we call CDVs, which are carte de visites, which are little pictures from the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, signed by Abraham Lincoln and signed by other generals and U.S. Grant. That was exciting. That was another auction. And then I ran a few auctions in Manhattan, um, uh, ran a few important sales. I got into, um, so you know, I, was, I was heavily into autographs at that point. So then all my energy actually, almost most of it was going into historical stuff because I was handling a lot of stuff there created my own auction house um, 
So I ran my auction house, helped my father run his auction house. We ran out of the same office for, for several, for a while. And then, um, and then in 1997, I broke the world record. I sold the most expensive autograph letter ever sold at the time. I think the record used to be a piece of the Gettysburg Address that Christie's Auction House sold. And this was a 10-page letter signed by Abraham Lincoln that, to a subcommittee that changed the course of the Civil War and ended up giving the momentum back to the, to, to the Union. That was tremendously exciting. And then... Um, the the thing you, 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 you broke the record. What was the record that you... How... how, how, uh, how what did it sell for? What was the new record you set? If you recall, At the time it was uh, 1.65 is what I sold it for. I think the record was 1.55, if my memory is correct. Yeah. And, um, and then the following year, sold another two-page letter written by um, uh, written by Abraham Lincoln, all written by him and signed by him, um, that ended up getting the Lincoln-Douglas debates printed, which helped. Lincoln get the Republican candidacy for president. Sold that too for over, sold that for about a million five five. And that was a record for a pre-presidential because it was, it was in 1858, he was not president yet. So that was, that was, that, that was a record price too. And um, so then I started gravitating towards photography. And the auction I had in Manhattan, it was a lot of photography. Um, had a great consignment in there by a, a a famous collector who's passed away about 10, 15 years ago by the name of Wes Marins put together a great collection, sold a big part of it in, at Christie's in the, in the mid nineties. And um, I knew him well, I sold a bunch of his stuff in, in an auction in New York, along with a bunch of other things. And um, I started really gravitating to, to images and, and really, really, really took a liking to photography and um, envision. And then I started, I started combining autographs with photographs and started really taking a, a liking to signed photographs. So that was kind of the beginning of the end for me in a way. Um, because when I say that was I started really kind of like hoarding away my stuff that I knew was so rare because I was young, but I handled a lot of great stuff that I knew that I might never find another Robert E. Lee photo signed three times, signed on the back twice and the front once. And I started to really turn a little bit more, a lot more to a collector. And, you know, it's, it's dangerous when you're a collector, when you're a dealer and you become a collector. It's, it's, it's very dangerous. I mean, you're, you're basically, you're a dealer. If you're a dealer and you become a user, you got a big problem. So for me, that I was becoming a user. I didn't want to sell my product. I wanted to keep it for me, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. so, um, so, uh, uh, you know, at the time I was getting married and then I, I ended up getting into a, a whole other business that my wife and I started. That was a spectacular business that we, that, that we, we sold 10 years later, but I, I really left the business, but I did continue to collect. I would pick off things consistently that entire time that I'd left the business. And fortunately, I, I, I did that. It allowed me to stay connected. And um, my signed photograph collection um, is one of the best in the country. If it's, uh, you know, from Babe Ruth to, you know, I'm looking at all this around me to, to, to Lindbergh, to Marilyn Monroe, I have a big Marilyn Monroe collection, to Cassius Clay, to Ty Cobb, to Robert E. Lee, to Harry Houdini, to Winston Churchill. So it's, it's, it's not just sports. To me, it's Americana, you know? And, 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 and you know, when I mentioned this, I think when we briefly caught up the other night, you know, in my family room, I have a picture, I, you know, I have, I have pictures everywhere. And I have a picture of, uh, I have a picture of, um, I have a Babe Ruth next to a photograph from 1869 when they completed the Transcontinental Railroad by a photographer's name is A.J. Russell. Famous, famous picture. And I made a find of the most famous pictures of that day. I think it's May 9th, 1869. So I have next to, I have a Babe Ruth. I have my, my, my large format photograph of, of, of the Transcontinental Railroad. It's called the Golden Spike Ceremony. And next to that, I have a U.S. Grant decorative autograph on a, a, what I call a steel engraving. So I'm kind of eclectic of what I collect, but to me, my sports stuff 
is is it's 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 so vintage it's americana it's not memorabilia yeah yeah cool okay i want to go to a couple comments and we're gonna come back 70s card show says he's from philly wife has orders to sprinkle ashes at fenway i love the the loyalty uh eric says we can have jeremy sit behind one of the posts and he can crane his neck so yeah. i don't know what the yeah, uh, yeah thanks yeah. eric thanks eric you know I'm, you know i've been having some back issues the last few days and uh contender sports says love hearing different collectors origin stories thanks for bringing us these interviews always inspiring and motivating that's great uh and thanks to collectible for for bringing us these episodes as well Gar jerry gary uh, welcome to the show good to see you again and uh, Gross Bros says, Larry, hire me as your butler. You can pay me one with one historical auto per month. There you go. There you go. Are you hiring? Just kidding. So talk about this now because, you know, to me, after coming away from our discussion the other night, I realized that, like, this guy understands what is important. He understands what is iconic. You have a real good eye for the stuff. Now, it might seem obvious, but I'm not going to assume that it is. So I want to ask, you know, what tips would you give people out there that you have utilized in your own collecting life in terms of how to spot or what to look for and really what makes an item iconic and important? Okay. It's a lot there. So the first thing is I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to answer that question with the first part of it that I cannot answer. And I can't say, I can't answer that and say what makes an item important. I can answer that and what makes an item important to me. Sure. Right? Um, but, but, but what makes an item important, that's why people, that, that's why collecting is great. Because you can collect whatever you want for whatever reason you want. Because you might have, a, you know, because you have a connection to it or whether it brings you back to something or whether, you know, for any reason at all. And that's important, Right. So what's important to me might be completely different than what's important to everybody else. So to answer the question about what's important is I think it's very critical that everyone collects something that's important to them. Okay. For me, I like, you know, I like, I like really rare, really clean, really good condition type of items that connect I feel that they, in some way, many times removed, connect me to that event in history. And it makes me feel in my own way that somehow, you know, somehow I'm connected to that. And it, it, it's nostalgic, you know, and, and it's, it's, um, and it's, and it's just fun. It's hard to explain it. it, it it's, just, it's, it's just exciting to be able to, uh, to, to, to be able to have the privilege of, of, of having something connected to something that, that I can connect with. And, and I mean, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let, no, let me do this for a second, because there's another way I think to, to look at this uh, that I know that you'll agree with. So, you know, there are some items out there that are, that are single focused, you know, a ball, signed by Ted Williams is, is it really just has baseball in it, but I'm going to share my, I'm going to share my screen right now and show an item from your collection. You sent me a picture of it and let's yeah. talk through this item and, uh, and kind of, you know, what, what is important about an item like this? It's not sports, yeah. but talk yeah. about this item and why you love it. And like, and just so people know, Larry has this framed in, in hanging on a wall in his house. He showed it to me the other night. Talk about like, you saw yeah. this, you I saw this, Larry. You knew there was something important about it. Why is this item important? I love this piece. This piece has so this piece hits it uh, for so many different reasons for me. So what this is, this is approximately uh, I don't know, I'm probably about 17 inches wide by maybe 14 inches tall, and it's a thin piece of paper that was folded for years. And what this is is, in, you know, this this, this in this, the historical world, you call it an advertising broadside, right? So but so but what this is, it's an advertisement. If you look in the far right and the far left, you can actually see some lines going down there where uh, our, our store would actually put that on their wall if they sold Mickey Mouse cards in 1935, which is when Mickey Mouse cards came out. So what I love about this is I'm very into color, right? So I love the color on this piece. The condition, I've seen, I think, three of these in 25 years, and 
I mean, the other two are not even all there. This has zero restoration. It's almost in perfect condition. It's got great color. It's it's dizzy, you know, Dizziania. It's Disney. Okay, so it's Disney. It's Mickey Mouse. Okay, now this I love. Look at this bubble gum cards. A question by Mickey Mouse, and a picture card answer in every pack for one penny. Save the wrappers and get a Mickey Mouse picture album. And there's a picture of them with the album. And there's the bubble gum, you know, he's making the bubble. What I love about this is the connection to cards, right? So this also has the advertisement, antique advertisement aspect to it too. It's got the card aspect to it for a very popular set in 1935, which is a really, really collectible set. And then I like this, the, the, the fact that you could get rappers to get this album. So I have every intention to buy that album, which you can get, which you would put, you know, for the cards. So I, this just hits it on so many things. I've never bought a, a Mickey Mouse piece before, but when I saw this in a sports auction, I knew I had to have it and I had to pay for it because other people wanted it too. But it's a great item and it's a, you, it's almost one of a kind. It's one of a kind in this collection, in, in this condition. And it's just, it's just got everything going for it. So that's 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 why I had to have that piece. Yeah, and I like, you know, again, it touches on different areas of collecting, not just one. And uh, I think that's pretty important. Um, you have another piece in your collection that is truly iconic that you, you were telling me. I, I, I'd like you to, I'm going to show the picture of it. Yeah. And I'd like you to explain to, to the audience and myself why this piece why you felt this piece was so special. I'm gonna show a picture of it right now. There it is. Yeah. What is this and why is it so special? Well, I'm gonna guess that 90% of the listeners, the viewers, probably have already guessed what that piece is. And that's exactly why um, it's so iconic because there's not many things on this earth that you can simply look at a picture and know what it is. This is, a, do you want me to tell what it is now? Or are we going yeah, to go? Yeah, sure. Well, do, you have a, uh, do you have that other picture I sent you? Because uh, because that will help me kind of explain the scenario. But if you don't, don't worry about it. No big I don't think I have it handy, actually. So let's, sure. let's go. So, this is the Wicked Witch, Witch, Witch of the West hat. And in the other picture I, I sent Jeremy, um, right when the house falls on the Wicked Witch of the East, who's wearing the ruby slippers, and 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 the Wicked Witch of the West comes up. The house lands in Munchkinville, lands on the Wicked Witch of the East, comes out and at a, a, a red puff of smoke, goes up to Dorothy, and that's the picture. That's the other picture I afforded you. Uh, comes I'm, up to Dorothy and says, "I'll get you and your cute little dog too." And she's wearing this specific hat. So uh, I saw that piece, and. I just felt it was one of the most iconic pieces of Hollywood memorabilia there is. And such a famous movie, such a famous scene, you know, the, the whole thing. It just, I felt that it was one of the best, it is one of the best pieces, there it is. So that's right after the house falls on the sister, she sees her sister has been crushed by the house. She comes out and says, I'll get you and your cute little dog too. Um, and that's 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 my hat, of which I own with a friend of mine. We we, we were equally as excited about buying that hat. And, and so, uh, like, the reason why you you purchased it is because of its iconicism and right. the importance of it. Because, and again, I'm trying to I'm trying to kind of get out of you, like, to convey it to people that you know, if you want to, if you want to find something to purchase now that, that is going to be valuable down the road. And when you spend serious money on something, it becomes an investment. I believe that to be the case, at least for me. So, and it's, it's there's a thing to be said for enjoying owning something as well. And later we're going to talk about the, about, about cheaper items too. But, but for now, you know, when you, if you want to pick up an item or you see something that you think could be very popular down the road, like when, for example, when Star Wars started, when they came out with the second movie in 1980, maybe the chance to buy a prop from the first movie would have been a very, a, a very savvy move. And these are the kind of things that lead to big sales down the road when you, you know, for some and for some to make a lot of money on an item. Now, 
I we don't. I always like to emphasize collecting because you know this show is called Collectible Live. I, we're me and Larry. We're both collectors. Most people watching this are collectors. I don't want to focus a ton on the money, but it's hard to avoid it when these things can be worth so much money. So when we talk about importance and iconic, I think it's you know Wizard of Oz is an all time. It's one of the most important movies made in cinematic history. So one of the one of the most iconic props from it are going to be extremely valuable. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? You know what, what? What attracted me to this piece um, is that that, like I said, it's so recognizable. There's not that many not that many things in the world that are more recognizable than that witch hat, and and it's you know so many people are familiar with it and can relate to that or, or understand what that is. That to me, that's an important piece, an important element to making a long-term investment. And, you know, doing that, you know, I didn't do this in the early stages, right? The movie was, I think, 1939. <laughs> you know, so, so you, know, you, you know, I didn't go in in the early stages and speculate, you know, like a modern investment in cards or something, right? So, that, you know, that I had to pay a lot of money for that hat. But, um, um, you know, as, as it, it's not just, you know, when you buy something in auction, you know, you have to be willing to pay more than anyone else, of course. Okay, goes on set, and you're not only buying it because of what it's worth today. You're you're, you're buying it because you feel. Oh, I do. I feel that as the market expands, which the market's expanding, and there's many reasons I can say why, but I don't want to get distracted right now. Um, the market expands. New people come into the marketplace. Um, the economy changes <laughs> for up and down. Right now, we're down, of course. Um, and that all helps develop the marketplace. And that's when things move. And, 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 and by creating more demand, and, um, and by creating more, and this is an important point right here, by creating more demand or getting more interest whether it's new blood to the hobby or using fractionalization to create more demand, okay? To allow people to participate and compete in items can all, and create liquidity uh, and through, you know, through regulation and through the SEC is actually, I feel a very important part of the hobby growing going forward because of access and regulation. But I think that's maybe another question, but it just kind of came to me. It's, it's, it's how, so basically it's about creating more demand and it, it, it's not creating more demand. It's, it's, it's being in the right place with the right asset at the right time. And sometimes that takes time. And, um, and it all really comes down to, you know, it comes down to, it comes down to the buy. Yeah. And when you're paying record prices for things, or you know, sometimes I pay world record prices for things, and people are saying, "How could you pay this much for this? This is more than anyone's willing to pay." And I might think it's cheap, because I think the market has a lot more room to expand, and I think that there's going to be more demand for certain things because at certain levels the market's thin, and and if the market is thin, and not as robust as it it, it should be. The neck sometimes creates bargains. Yeah. I think when I said that, when I gave that analogy earlier about uh, buying a prop from Star Wars and 70s card show calls me out and says, yeah, we all should have bought Apple stock in 1998 as well. Yeah, that wasn't great. And I'm not always the best at coming up with, with metaphors or uh, right, right on, on the fly sort of thing. But really, I think what, what we're saying is, you know, number one, buy the best if, if you can. If you have the money, buy the best that you can and buy it at whatever you have to pay because the next time you the next time it sells, when you're selling it, it's going to sell for more money. We've seen that with the Tito 6 Honus Wagner. No one's ever lost money on a Tito 6 Honus Wagner. And you just said, Larry, you've paid world record prices. Well, you have no choice when you buy the best. You have to, you have to pay above comps on very rare items. And if it's a one of a kind, you have to pay a world record price. And sometimes it can be nervous. You can be nervous to do it, but if you have if you have the kahunas to do it, you're probably going to come out ahead at the end of the day. There was another piece there. Yeah, there was another piece of a four dog that was a poster, 
whether you want to bring it up or not, it doesn't matter. But that's a scenario where that 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 it's the best of the best, and and you know, me and two colleagues paid a world record price for it. And 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 the reason for that is because we feel that the market is just uh, the market is um, just starting to mature. And uh, so 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 the so the the elements that make up how to buy um, are always changing very, you know, it's, it's very fluid. It's very fluid. And there's so many moving parts that, that, that go into a decision to buy something, whether to buy something aggressively or whether to, to maybe be conservative or maybe stand down and, and, and not buy. And I mean, like what, you know, even the Wizard of Oz, right? It's obviously a very important piece of cinematic history, but I've had discussions with people over the years where like certain movies and TV shows and are going to be eventually maybe forgotten. Does there ever become a point where, you know, you might be left holding, holding the bag or, or are there some pieces that are just never going to be, never going to fade away? You know, that's it's kind of out of my area a little bit because like like I don't like speculate on modern stuff or like who's going to be a star and who's not. You know, there are, one thing I learned through through stamps, you know, is that there's a lot of stamps that are really rare. You know, they just didn't print a lot of them. They're really rare, and some of them aren't that valuable. And then there's the stamps like the Irmil Invert, which is a hundred known, and now they, you know, they go for you know a really clean copy will bring a million or a little little more than a million, because there's a great story behind it and pe pe people care. So so sometimes you know sometimes things become. It's all going to be driven by interest. If there's not enough interest in something, you know, sometimes something can be dormant for years, and then it can have this crazy, you know, resurgence that it becomes cool now right when it wasn't cool 20 30 years ago and then that's the kind of scenario i don't go there because I, I, i'm not usually a modern guy right so so that's that would happen most likely more on modern stuff but um that does happen but it's kind of out of my out of my you know real familiarity yeah it's, fair it's, enough it's a sweet spot let's go to a few more comments here I, a little bit late on this mark good evening to you uh, Eric says to get a true feel for Fenway Park, you need to sit in an obstructed view seat at least once. Very good, very good. Brian Adams, welcome to the show. Uh, 70s Car Joe says when we were talking about Mickey Mouse, it's ironic since fanatics will mouseify our hobby in the near future. That remains to be seen. Contender Sports Cards wants to know what is the most valuable piece Larry owns? If you're willing to uh, to get into that, Larry. You know, I, I don't, I don't, hard for me to get, sometimes I, I don't really that put a monetary value on certain things, but myself and a, two colleagues have put together two very significant collections, the, the, um, um, the Jackie Robinson collection, which is now actually in the Jackie Robinson Museum. We have several items in there that just opened up which is tremendously exciting. And in there, um, there is, um, oh, okay. So there is, uh, well, these, these are great items. So this is, uh, this is uh, that hat on top there, that's Jackie Robinson's hat. It's called the Beanball Hat. Uh, some of your viewers might have seen this hat. Um, came originally directly from the, the Robinson family. And when he broke the color barrier in 1947, um, they did not wear helmets at the time in Major League Baseball. So they sewed in plastic inserts in that hat to protect him. Because as everybody knows, you know, other players were incentivized to hurt him, to spike him, to bean him. And they did not want him on the field with them. And when we saw this item come up for sale a, a, a ways back, um, we first were attracted to it because uh, there's no sports memorabilia auction but we quickly recognized that that hat is a civil right artifact and it's the only thing that stood between him and a hundred mile an hour fastball and he was thrown out all the time so that's one of my favorite items i'm not gonna i'm not it's, it's a very valuable item whether it's the most valuable or not i think is irrelevant 
but it's a really significant civil right artifact, which the entire collection is, which is why we formed the collection. And that is his jacket. And that jacket has 42 on the sleeve, which you can't see. Very, very significant. And that is a great game used glove um, that the museum was very excited to, to display as well. Um, so those are just three of our items there. We have some more significant items um, that just aren't in this picture there. And the collection just is uh, very important. I uh, feel very privileged to actually be displaying some of these important civil rights artifacts in the Jackie Robinson Museum. And excited to be, you know, have a partnership with the, uh, you know, the Jackie Robinson, the Robinson Foundation, because um, they are a um, class organization. And this museum that now is open to the general public, I think just a week ago, because the grand opening was a month ago, but not to the public. Um, I really, I, everyone should go. They're doing some interesting content. Um, when we were there, there are a lot of kids there. And um, it's exciting. It's really exciting stuff. And it's an interactive museum that I think can make a big difference. So, so just excited to, and privileged really to have a few of our items on display there in partnership in, in, in terms of showing it. With them. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazingly cool. Amazingly cool. Very nice stuff. And just the privilege of owning that, that, that cap and the other pieces is, uh, is extremely special. It's more than just sport. It's, uh, well, oh, yeah. Can I interject? I didn't mean to. I didn't mean, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, I was, no, go ahead. So it's interesting. You just said right there, you know, it's more than just sport. So, you know, you know when first that, that hat came up, you know, myself and a colleague of mine, uh, Seth Keller, Seth Keller is an expert in, we go back 30 years and, and, you know, from the historical document days and have done a tremendous amount of business together over the years. And, um, and what, what attracted us to the piece, and, and Seth, you know, he's, he's an expert in declarations of independence and freedom documents. Um, and when we saw this, we realized the civil right significance of an item like this. And we weren't initially buying it to build a whole collection around it. But what happened was we bought that. We got so excited about it. We realized how important it was. And at the time, we paid a world record price for it. Okay. Um, and we ended up buying his 1949 contract, Major League Baseball contract as the second item. I was actually talking about this last night with my friend, as the second item. And that we were so excited about buying because he won the MVP that year. That not only did he come forth and in, in, in persevere and deal with the the, the the racism, being thrown at, you know, being spiked, being insulted, you know, not did he persevere through that. He, two years later, became the best. He became the MVP. So when we bought that, then we that really fueled us to see what other items we could put together that help tell this story. And um, and you know. It was really fun. It was fascinating putting this collection together. And uh, on the uh, lines of that, in civil rights, we also put the Jesse Owens collection together. And in that Jesse Owens collection, um, um, which again, Seth Keller helped us, uh, helped us quarterback that, um, we, um, we have two of his four gold medals from 1936. Very significant pieces. And they won in Germany. Um, in the Olympics. Very cool. So, yeah, so it's fun. It's, it's we're passionate and it's 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 fun and it's uh but again it's like it wasn't sports member that's not sports memorabilia to us that's civil rights. Yeah for sure for sure so let's go to this comment from Justin he says seems like a good Americana collection involves a bit of creativity in determining what can be collected or what exactly is out there. I think that Makes a lot of sense. Answer this in one word, Larry. Do you know if there was only one copy of the witch hat made for the film? No, there's, there's... Thank you. Good. Gregory Mann, good to see you. Uh, 70s card, I put it up before, it says, gorgeous uniform looks better that way as opposed to a, a swatch on a card. It, it certainly does for sure. Now, let's talk a little bit about um, about the future of, 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 of the hobby with uh, with a bit of a spin as far as fractional goes, we've had two comments come in uh, so far. First of all, Gross Bro says, "What is the future of collecting?" In Larry's opinion, so I, I want to actually direct this towards fractional. That '70s card show said right here, 
should something go wrong with fractionals? I think he's meaning like collectible, rally, Otis, whoever else is doing it right now. He says the shareholders are last in line to recoup their investment. So I don't personally know if that's true or not. I don't know who's first in line if it wouldn't be the, the investors when that when that item is eventually sold. But let's talk a little bit about fractional. Obviously, Larry, you are an early investor in collectible. That tells me you must believe in fractional investing within the overall hobby landscape. Now, you're also a lifelong collector. Your father was a lifelong collector. So you've got collecting your blood going back 91 years. And I say that because that's the age of your father, maybe 81 when he was 10 years old. So all that saying, talk about fractional as far as being like an innovation in the hobby, where we're at now, where we see it going. Okay, sure. In my opinion, fractional is all about access, transparency, and liquidity. And to date, fractional really is in the top of the second inning. This has just started. The ability to invest in assets that that are regulated by the SEC, collectibles, that are regulated by the SEC and provides the opportunity to one day liquidate through a secondary market is not something that's gonna happen overnight. The innovation that, which is a lot of technology creates access to assets that people didn't might not have had access before to. Um, whether that is a $100,000 item, a million dollar item, or a $10,000 item, and they wanna buy a piece of that. And that access is interesting to the masses, especially as the market develops more. So what we have is, you know, we've had um, a lot of innovation in the last two years, a tremendous amount of innovation, disruption, um, and, and tech, combined by technology to, to enter into this market and concept of fractionalization. And we would then had a nice compounded environment of, of, of uh, a, a two year once in a lifetime um, 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 COVID boom, right? That had everyone tuned into the world to collectibles at that exact time. And now, you know, we have, uh, we have a scenario where you have, you know, in the public markets, there aren't, there aren't many, there's no IPOs right now in the public markets and in, in the big institutions and the economy and inflation. So we've had this whipsaw. But as we go through this, I feel, um, I know what collectible is working on. I know the innovation and the technology and the strategies they're working on. Um, one thing in particular um, that I find really interesting, and it's a der derivative of fractional, right, is, is I feel that over time, you know, and this is going to take three to five years to get the buy-in of the large financial institutions about collectibles of alternative assets. And once that happens, and I'm convinced that's gonna happen. And the reason I'm convinced that's gonna happen is because I look at the market pace in the last six weeks. Well, I was convinced it was gonna happen for years, but just to take a quick shot here at the marketplace in the last six weeks, I'm seeing world record price after world record price, okay? We saw the Muhammad Ali belt, the rumble in the jumble belt, sell for $6.18 million. Okay. Then we saw this, uh, the Hornus Wagner card sell, uh, graded two, sold for $7.25 million, breaking the record of $6.6 .6 million for a card graded higher before. A lesser card sold for, for a million dollars, uh, whatever, $800,000 more in a year. And then we saw what happened to $12.6 million mantle. The press is going to continuously write about this 
These seven figure numbers are significant. The financial institutions are thinking, what are their plans for alternative assets? Okay, they're gonna have to have a roadmap. The large marketplaces out there, okay, wanna get involved in fractional, whether they wanna partner with the right company to do fractional, or whether they want to, whatever angle they want, they understand that it's an important play here to create access. So as there's more press and more records, that's gonna create more interest. And as there's more interest, that's gonna bring more collectors. And as it bring more collectors, it's gonna be more collectors at all levels. And I feel what's gonna happen then is that I think there's a possibility, uh, I think there's a very good possibility of alternative assets being a small piece, recommended piece of people's portfolios, just like stocks and bonds. And there's gonna be the mechanisms in the technology in place that is gonna allow them to have easy access uh, and get their funds in and their funds out. That's going to create the capacity and the, the base that's needed to really have healthy markets. And right now, Collectible and anyone else who's doing fractional, they're all siloed, right? They're all siloed in their individual market or secondary market. That's because we're just finished the first inning and we're in the top of the second inning. This needs to um, mature and it needs to have additional technology and additional innovation, which will spawn from the original concept of fractional. So I have another comment there, but do you wanna say something first? Cause I kind of went on long there. Okay. No, keep, keep going, please. So we feel, I mean, we feel that, um, um, you know, a derivative of fractional is group bidding. We're getting, think of crowd bidding, getting multiple people together who have a common interest at a common level and a common asset, and they buy something together. Um, obviously, this is what happened with the Constitution Dow uh, on a large scale, but that's another subject. And that is a very interesting phenomenon because if you can get people together, to buy an asset, then that and that asset be regulated, and that asset be, be be registered with the SEC, and then have the ability for that asset to 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 liquidate or to potentially buy more in a secondary market, that creates liquidity, and that also creates access. So if somebody's interested in buying something in an auction, example. Heritage had a great auction, obviously, with, with the mantle and the great auction in general there. There was a lot in that auction. And it was a signed lot of uh, 1986 Fleer basketball cards signed by everybody, minus one or two. Okay? Um, um, a group orchestrated, put together investors of collector, you know, who, who, customers of collector, bought that lot together. You know, I don't know if it's uh, eight people or, or 20 people. That's, 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 I don't know. Scenario, whereas now that is being prepared, it's being written up, it's being properly prepared to be listed with the SEC and to um, be listed and be regulated. And that's going to create an opportunity for people to, 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 to liquidate um, that asset, if they'd like, uh, on the secondary market. And it, it allows them to particip participate in it because they thought it was a good investment, okay? And, and, um, and it creates the structure in order to have that flexibility and liquidity at a later date. That, I think you're going to see at major auction houses in general. I think that's an interesting concept. I think you're going to see that layered over major marketplaces of being able to offer, you know, fractionalization on top of stocks, on top of bonds, on top of crypto. You know, I think you're gonna get more and more records that are gonna be made. We're breaking records in an economy that is terrible right now. We're breaking records in the worst inflation in 40 plus years. And we're iconic items are breaking records. Not all levels of the market are hot, 
right? I understand that. But as we break more records, we're gonna have more people in the hobby. We're gonna have more of a demand for, for vehicles that financial institutions are gonna have to have a roadmap. It's going to happen. I'm, very, I'm convinced of it. And it's a matter of realizing that you don't, this doesn't evolve over one night. And it can't be siloed. It needs to be larger marketplaces. And um, so what they've accomplished to date, I, I'm proud of. I mean, I guess, uh, I guess, you know, I guess I could be biased, you know, because because uh, I'm proud of them. But really, the innovation and the disruption and the things that they are working on now are tremendously exciting. And I think they'll you're be speaking, fun. you're speaking directly about collectible. Yeah. On that scenario. Yeah. On that last comment there. Yeah. So uh, thank you. And um, but yeah, no, I feel that I feel that. Um, the market, no matter who's in fractional, okay, and we know there's a lot of players in there. Um, I think it's key to to the larger the pool, the more siloing there is of, of this person, this company doing this, and this company doing this, and this company doing this. You know, it, it's you know, it's hard to get capacity that way. It's hard to get scale that way. And 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 as these marketplaces who have shown a lot of interest in fractional and vaulting is another derivative of investing in collectibles because it really takes some of that emotion out of it because in some cases you're not even taking possession of the asset so it all kind of plays together and and there's going to be a lot more innovation out there that's that that uh that we're not even at yet and um so yeah i think we're in the top of the second hope that answers. yeah (laughs) yeah no i I mean i I think fractional is very early as well, and I think that once we see more liquidity on second on the secondary markets, and uh, the the economy turns around, which eventually it's going to, we'll see more buyout offers. Like we were having buyout offer after buyout offer at the beginning. Of the I remember we were talking about them on the show all the time. So it's everything cyclical, and we'll get back there. We're in overtime already, but I do want to come up with. The, I do want to go to a couple of. Um, Couple of comments that '70s show doesn't like fractional. He's it's very clear that that '70s show uh, is against fractional. But let's go to a couple of his comments and we'll see if you can if you can respond to them. So he says right here, we know how many shares exist of publicly traded companies. We don't know how many more gem mantles are out there. I think what he's talking about here is that you know we see we have these fines all the time that people are you know someone's golden finds this all these T206s at the national all of a sudden there's all these new cards coming into into the populations what do you say to this comment which i this one i actually think is you know pretty legitimate but at the same time i don't know how many more are going to be gem mint out there or so, I mean, I mean, and, I'm, and i'll preface my comments with you know I, I i don't have a crystal ball or i don't know all the answers but my my my, my thought on that is you know if you have something if you have a mantle and it's mint you know and it's really high grade you know and i and i owned it i'm gonna want to grade it so you know maybe there's another find out there maybe there's another 52 case out there i i I doubt it but you know maybe there is one out there but as we get further and further down the road the odds of that happening are less and less and less and less but but the goal is that maybe there are some more out there and maybe they're maybe they're maybe maybe they are graded i think that would be a good thing I mean, if there was 50 of them, I don't think it'd be a good thing. But I think that I think a gem will, will find its way to the surface that it may be every once in a while. But but um, I think as time goes on, the odds of that go down, 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 down. Yeah, I think the odds are pretty low. But I would think that there's certainly some high grade stuff. Yeah, we do. We do see find new 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 inventory finding its way into the public uh, marketplace here over time uh the next comment he makes here says investing with the heart is a losing proposition just that one sentence right there it depends what your heart loves if your heart loves you know jackie robinson items i don't think it's a losing proposition if your heart loves truly rare items i don't think it's a losing proposition i think it's a very winning proposition you got to get your brain controlling your heart a little bit more maybe in terms of or you just have to it depends what you love If, if all you love are pogs then maybe you are that that is correct goes on to say either you're buying for nostalgic reasons well nostalgia is a big uh a big underpinning of, of value um or you're willing or you're rolling the dice on an unknown quantity of inventories or anything you'd like to say about that yeah in, in, in general you know I, I always say buy what you love right i think i said that earlier in the interview you're gonna buy what you love you got to do what you love you know um um but you know when it comes to investing 
you can't always buy what you love. But every once in a while, you can buy what you love if you love the concept of what you're buying and, you, and you're looking at something maybe through a different lens and you, and, 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 and you think you might be four or five years before the curve, then you can actually combine buying what you love and invest it. But that's very, very rare to do that. And it's very difficult. So, um, so yeah, I mean, if you're investing, it's not about love, you know, it's about making money. And if you're buying what you love, yeah, it's a losing proposition in most cases. But if some cases, some cases it's not, depending on what your strategy is. So I, I kind of agree with what he's saying to some point. Yeah, yeah, some, somewhat for myself. Uh, it goes on to say, do independent shareholders ever own more than 49% of these fractionals? And I think here the question is the, the assets, not the fractional company themselves. He says, I assume the company always holds a majority. I think that's actually a false assumption, I believe. And I, I actually pretty much know for a fact that the, the fractional company themselves uh, own zero to maybe a very small percent of the assets themselves. These are these are oftentimes the original consigner retains a certain amount and then the rest is offered. The company owns maybe zero in most cases, yeah. no? So this is really, you know, you're asking me a question, you know, I'm not in the day-to-day -day operations of this company. I'm an early investor in the company. So you're asking me a question that, you well, know. Well, I'm, I'm putting it in, in case, not asking you as if I'm expecting an answer. I'm putting well, it no, there. No, I'm saying a question, not you. I'm reading the question. So, so it's all over the board. I mean, but that's not something that I have insight on that I can answer. I'm not in the day to day of the company, and that's 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 out of my area. But it's your your comments of all over the board are correct. I mean, that from a general statement, I know, but I don't really have a comment on that. Yeah, well, I, I I've I mean, I've been working with Collectible for over a year now, doing this show, and I see the offerings and um and i've even looked at some of the sec filings and <laughs> excuse me i'm i'm almost certain that collectible themselves you know maybe hold i don't know a small percent of of these assets if at all so i do believe that they're most for the most part they are offered to the public to their to their customers yeah in an offer i do know that in an offering all the information is listed i do know that but i don't know yeah. that now now, now, this this I just think is completely wrong, 70s card show, because if the company becomes insolvent, the collectible actually creates a different, uh, a new company for each IPO. Each asset is a company itself that is not owned by collectible, uh, the collectible company. So I think you're just dead wrong on that, but you might not be wrong when it comes to some other uh, fractional companies that I can't speak of because I don't work with them, but I... I know you're dead wrong on that when it comes to collectible themselves. Um, so because you don't, because seventies card show just doesn't understand how these things are, are legally structured and I wouldn't expect you to, but I would, I would kind of ask my audience at least to have some research before throwing out uh, something that looks like a fact when it's just, when it's just not right, not correct at all. Um, Okay, uh, Justin says, I, I, I think future regulation of high-end collectibles would be a good dialogue for a future show. Thank you, Justin. 70s card says, I don't dislike the concept. I just think marketing towards the sentimentality of collectors is a dangerous prop. I don't know, again, sentimentality, nostalgia, that's what drives the whole collectibles industry. So I think it's oh. I think it's kind of falls right in line, at least well, myself. Collectibles are driven by passion and, and desire. That doesn't mean that you have to combine passion and desire in investing. I, I do, right? Because I'm very passionate about what I buy. I invest. I also collect. So, you know, it's just people operate differently. But uh, yeah, no, for sure. For sure. Um, Gregory Mann, welcome, says the heart is OK, but the head goes to Pokemon or magic, soccer, etc. And 70 says, good to know on that. Thanks. I had assumed the firm held the majority of the shares. Yeah, I just don't think they do. I, I know they don't for because I've looked at several filings, uh, SEC filings that Collectible has has That's made 70s. I'm not trying to be hard on you or anything, but I do I do kind of just, you know, I I just even in in real life, you know, when 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 I when I see someone put something into the into the put something out there stated as fact when it just isn't and the stated as fact based on assumption and there's been the research isn't complete, I just kind of wish that it would have been. Yes. So I, I, I'm not lying. I'll make I'll make one comment. The beauty of of registering with the SEC is that it helps make the process transparent, but people need to determine if they want to make it transparent and they want to, they, they, whether they read the, read the offerings. 
So the percentage of ownership is listed 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 in the offerings. So so yeah, it's, yeah. it's all and it's all in the public domain, so it's it's, it's all available. Uh, Seventy says uh, collectibles is different than investments. The lines are blurred. I mean, yes and no. Like I, I it just depends. Like well, sure, let me, sure. Let me ask this question, okay? How about the gentleman that bought the uh, the um, the fifty two mantle? For fifty thousand, it just sold for twelve point six million. Do you think that's? Do you think he thinks it's an investment? I do. Of course. Exactly. So collectible collectibles is different than investing. The lines. Are, nah. So, so, so no, no, because that it was a collectible. Yeah, it was collectible and it was an investment, and he made a ton of money. But that's obviously not the norm in terms of that type of return. But, but yeah, yeah. It's like PSA 10 says right here. Have you ever lost money on collectible investments? Well, of course, just like you lose money on stocks all the time or, or more traditional investments. Collectibles are alternative investments. That's that's important. I'll answer this question. Have you ever, just a general question, have I ever lost money in collectibles? The answer is yes. I've lost money in collectibles. Um, you're not right all the time, you know, but I've lost money in collectibles here and there, but, but you know, Certainly not often, but yeah, you never write all the time. I mean, if so, if everyone was right all the time, they they do, you know, it doesn't work that way. Whether you invest in stocks, it just doesn't work that way. All right, Larry, listen, we're going to wrap up. We've been going a long time. I want to listen. I'm going to read out the final comments that have come have, that have come in. I do want to thank uh, everyone in the chat, 70s, and everybody else who's been very engaging. Thank you for all your comments, your questions. This has been a lot of fun. We're we usually don't go past an hour on Collectible Live. We're we're, all, we're over and we're an hour 12 already. Uh, Larry, you're a fascinating guy. I'm going to go through the final comments here. Baseball card curmudgeon. What's up? Joined late. We'll go back and watch before this later. Yeah, go back and watch it. Thank you. Contender says, love this interview. Very informative. Thank you, Contender. 70 says, exactly. It is different. Therefore, the sentimentality should not be part of it. But it is. But it is. You can't take the white out of rice. And Justin Vick says, you can take a step back and make a logical investment decision anticipating the passion others have for collectible. Bingo. Foul five ball. Good to see you as always. And 70 says, you're comparing it to stocks, yet you're saying I'm wrong about the shareholders and their spot in line confused. It's a, it's, that's a legal structure versus an investment. I understand and I agree you are confused in that 70s. That's okay. All right. That's going to do it. Larry, thank you so much. This was great. Appreciate you, man. Thank you, Jeremy. I appreciate it. Hopefully, uh, hopefully there was some, uh, hopefully the listeners liked it. Yeah, for sure. I certainly did. PSA 10 says this episode was a solid 10. Uh, thanks, us, thanks us for the dialogue. That's going to be it, guys. Larry, hang tight right there. Everybody else, again, thank you so much. Have a great week ahead, and we will be back next week with another episode of Collectible Live. This 